Okay, so I'm starting to record. So, does anyone have any like kind of just starting up questions? I didn't I haven't really receive any feedback from you guys after the videos or anything. So I either taught it super well or everyone's been focusing on farm stuff, right? Yes, ma'am. You should know the like the concepts that go into that, right? So like knowing things like what effect does um, your sample size have on the, those different factors, right? So for instance, like you know, standard deviation is kind of immune to the effect of sample size because it's not calculated using that, right? Sam you know, standard deviation. What is standard deviation? Yes, yeah, the variability about the mean of the data, right? So you have your data, you get the, the average, and so how much variability is there within that data, right? So that standard deviation uh, is, is really kind of immune to that because it's inherent to how the, the data came from the sample, right? Um, on the other hand, though, if you're doing things like confidence intervals, that very much is influenced by your sample size. And larger the sample size, you know, where did sample size go in the, or did it go in the numerator or the denominator in, in calculating confidence interval? The denominator, right? So as it gets bigger, what happens to your confidence interval? Get smaller, which is good, right? Because that means you have a, a narrower group of values that you can be very sure is actually representative of the population that you're concerned with, right? So that's a good thing, right? So you typically want to have larger sample size, and this is actually a thing we'll look at here when we're when we're uh, you know looking at this data to see what effect would sample size have on this kind of information, right? Or their their kind of conclusions that it would have here. So, um, right. So kind of know the the principles there that go into what do these different variables have on the downstream effects, essentially. Any other burning question? Anything you're just like, I have no freaking clue what you're talking about. Something like p-values, like, or just anything. Yes? When it gets to like, the last power point, you have this chart with all the different sort of meters. You know, how do you look at like, survival data, whether it's paired or unpaired? How in-depth do we need to get to um, if we the the charts are a little bit more in depth than what we uh, covered during the actual lectures, if we covered it in the lecture, then I would expect you to know for for the test, right? So I would expect you to know things like you know when would uh, say a paired t test versus an unpaired t test be appropriate, right? So when would when would one be appropriate versus the other? Or what does the t test even do? So basically, say I have uh, a study that I'm doing, right? And of course. Me being the farm guy, I always fall back to farm stuff, right? So say, for instance, I were to give half of you guys, you have 32 of you, uh, guys and gals, uh, have, uh, a medication to, say, increase your study capacity. Just uh, say we're giving you, let's try cocaine. Let's say we're going to give cocaine, see what your test grades uh, do afterwards. And the other half of you, I'm just going to give caffeine too, right? So afterwards, you guys will take the test and you get my grades back. Now I want to compare the results of that, right? So in that case, would that be a paired test or an unpaired test? Unpaired, right? Because there's no relationship between the 32 that got the caffeine versus the 32 that got cocaine, right? There's no relationship between the two. So because of that, I can do an unpaired test, right? Unless two of your twins or something I wasn't aware of, a uh, brother and sister, that would obviously invalidate the, those assumptions, right? Because when you have these tests being performed, you have certain assumptions you're going to be making. That's, again, something we'll, we'll kind of address here in the article. Versus if I were to say give all of you uh, caffeine, you take a test and then uh, let it wash out for a period of, say, two weeks and then come back, give you cocaine, and then take another test. Um, at that point, would that be paired or unpaired? That would be paired, right? Because now I'm doing kind of a pre and post, right? I'm doing two different um, interventions and seeing how those results change, essentially. Um, so that that would be like kind of the big difference there. So being able to, to kind of interpret, like, hey, should I use a t-test, right? Uh, which is good for what type of uh, variables, right? So kind of going back to the very basics, what type of variables do we have? With nominals, what's nominal? <laughs> yeah, so typically they're just um, categories, right? So male, female, uh, red, blue. Uh, is there any inherent relationship between the variables or the, the categories? <coughs> Not really, right? So red's not better than blue. Guy's not better than girl. Uh, they're just different, right? And so if you have just two, you would call that what? Dichotomous, right? So dichotomous variables are ones that just have two two uh, variables to them. So if we were doing something like, um, you know, alive or dead, that's dichotomous, right? Because there's two outcomes there, okay? Two categories. There's... That's an, that could be another name for it, right? So a dichotomous variable, uh, binomial variable, because binomial just, you know, uh, two names, right? So essentially that could be the same. So 
you can look at those uh, essentially the same. You'll find that in some cases in stats, there's like multiple names for kind of very similar things. Uh, unfortunately, it's one of kind of the, the oddities of it, but um, it's a good thing you, you pointed that out because it's good to, good to know. So I'm not going to get super granular on that kind of stuff. I'm not going to try to trick you on, on anything like that. Um, so we have nominal, right? So again, no inherent value um, uh, between two. One's not better than the other. One's not greater than the other. Um, so you have nominal. Then what else do you have? So there's continuous. What do you kind of do before you get to continuous? What if I had something like I was giving you guys, uh, or when you guys are doing your evaluations for classes after you finish the semester, right? What type of scales do you use? Ordinal scales, right? So you're using what we call a Likert scale. That's where you start off with like disagree, um, agree, strongly agree, whatever. You know, so those are things where certainly strongly disagree is different, or, you know, is less than agree, which is less than strongly agree, right? So there's a relationship between the different uh, categories, but you can't necessarily say how much better strongly agree is than agree, right? It's really kind of subjective in a lot of cases. And so uh, because there's not an actual inherent number difference between those, that's what leads it to be an ordinal variable, okay? Make sense? Uh, and then we mentioned the kind of the, the last category. Yeah, so the way we're gonna have our continuous variables. That's gonna be uh, numbers along a scale. Again, the difference between one to two 99 to 100 is always going to be the same. And you can break down the continuous into two types. <clears throat> interval and ratio, what's the difference between the two? Yeah, so interval is ones where zero does not matter, right? So that would be something like temperature and Fahrenheit or Celsius, right? So you can have negative values there. And the big difference between that is I could subtract one value from another, so I can subtract temp temperatures from one another, but you can't do ratios between those, right? So uh, because of that, that's, they're not ratio uh, values at that point, right? So the zero point doesn't really matter um, versus something, IQ is another good example of that because you can't really have like zero IQ, you'd be like dead, I guess, right? Um, on the other hand, though, when you have your ratio variables, those are things that are uh, zero is, you know, you have zero weight, you can have zero blood pressure, you can have zero, um, that was another good example. Can you think of any? Zero length. I mean, you know, just, so there's lots of different things. So you can do ratios between those two at that point because the zero actually does matter at that point. So that's important. A lot of what we're going to be looking at in these type of studies inside of the medical literature typically is going to be ratio variables, or we'll see in some cases where we're looking at more kind of dichotomous or uh, or nominal variables here um, as we move forward. That kind of makes sense. So again, in, in knowing what type of test you're going to use based on the type of variables you're going to use is really important. So for instance, um, you know, could I do a t-test with something like you know, male versus female. Can't really do that because uh, basically you don't use that for nominal data or even for ordinal data. What we end up using t-test for is going to be for things that are like those kind of uh, continuous variables, essentially. Most often those are kind of ratio uh, type of variables, right? So I can compare a ratio between, you know, different blood pressures in different groups. I can use a t-test to compare those, those, those averages, right? Versus something like uh, male versus female or red versus blue. Like you can use things like um, chi-square test. Uh, those typically are what you end up using for those in a lot of cases where um, you can look at things like, you know, expected versus observed uh, to see if there's like an actual difference there. Is that starting to make some sense? Hopefully I'm synonymous with what we said during the lectures. So, um, all right, so what are the questions? How about dependent versus independent variables? What's the difference? Dependent uh, depends on what you change, right? So that means, so in this case, in this study we looked at, what would be the independent variable versus the dependent variable? So what would be the dependent variable? Did they get intubated, right? So again, whether or not they got ketamine or what dose of ketamine they got, depending on how they want to um, look at the, the independent variable, the thing that we're changing or the thing that we're fixing our, um, our, our analysis based on, the outcome is typically going to be the dependent variable, right? So for instance, if we were looking at, say we did a study where I give half people ketamine, half the other people not ketamine, and I see the, the rate of people being intubated, again, the dependent variable is the thing that's dependent on what I change, right? And so what I change is whether or not I gave you guys ketamine. I always use you guys as my study subjects. It's kind of unethical, but I'm going to go along with it, right? Does that make sense? Okay. So say, for instance, I were to, uh, let's go back to our example. We're doing, like, say, cocaine versus caffeine for um, the, you know, changes on, on uh, exam score. So, again, what would be my dependent variable? The exam score, right? So my independent variable being what, I, what uh, intervention I gave you guys. Um, 
in that case, what would be my null hypothesis if I were to perform that study? <laughs> so there's no difference, and what would that equate to as far as the outcome goes? No statistical significance in what? In test score, yeah. So there should be no statistically, there could be a little bit of difference, like the averages could be different, but if I were to do something like a, uh, a t-test, an unpaired t-test, I could look at that and say, okay, well, um, you know, uh, the likelihood of getting these differences is very highly just due to chance alone, uh, so I cannot reject that null hypothesis, and so I would say, yes, that, you know, cocaine versus caffeine doesn't matter, doesn't really change your exam scores based on the sample that I looked at, right? Um, in this case, what would you think would be the, the null hypothesis, looking at this ketamine. Yeah, it wouldn't change who gets intubated, right? So that, that would be their null hypothesis, saying that, hey, it doesn't matter um, any of these factors uh, that, you know, basically doesn't matter how much ketamine you got. You, it did not change uh, if you got intubated. All right, so we'll look at some more of those details in just a second here. Um, so any other things you guys are like, hmm, just not sure. About. Yes? <coughs> That's okay. I, I zone out to myself a lot. It's good <laughs> insomnia remedy. Um, so what, what is alpha? <clears throat> so that's what we set, right? As, as researchers or whoever's performing the study, they're setting what the alpha is. And basically they're saying that anything at uh, basically below this number, we would consider to be very unlikely just due to chance alone. We would consider this to be statistically significant, right? Most often, what you're going to find is the p-values get set at 0.05, or alpha is set at 0.05, essentially. And we're saying that we, uh, saying that, you know, if it's less than a 5% chance, just due to random chance alone, because again, the p-value is essentially what? Right, so it's basically saying, like, this value that you got, this average, like, how likely is it just due to chance alone, right? So it could be just, you know, it could be 50% due to chance, which means that it's, you know, very likely just to be due to chance alone. But as you get more and more extreme values away from that theoretical, you know, normal distribution, that average, um, it's less and less likely, right? So think about the flipping the coins, right? You'd expect if you flipped a quarter 100 times, how many heads should you get on average? 50, right? But if I were to, for instance, you get, you know, 17 heads in a row, uh, what is the likelihood of that being due to chance alone, right? Could be very low versus, you know, something, or, you know, even getting, say, 49 heads. That would be very, very unlikely. And so it would be, you see that that p value would be very, very low, you know, 0. 0.00001, uh, saying that, you know, that outcome due to chance alone is very unlikely. Maybe I was dealing with a bad quarter. Maybe it was, you know, weighted to one side or the other, right? Maybe I'm Harvey Dent and skewed the results somehow, right? my Batman fan. Um, so yeah, so anyway, so we set the alpha value, usually 0.05, uh, and then we will uh, calculate a p-value, and if it's less than an alpha, then you would say, hey, this is unlikely due to chance alone. This is considered to be statistically significant. And, but again, you're even saying, even if it's like 0.049, that's still almost a 1 in 20 chance that you're uh, rejecting that null hypothesis erroneously, and we would call that what type of error? Type 1 error, right? So when you reject a null hypothesis when you really shouldn't have, that's a type 1 error. So again, it's a 1 in 20 chance. Like, how is that pretty good? Like, do you want to tell your, your patient, hey, there's a 1 in 20 chance I'm wrong about giving you this medication? They're probably not going to like that, right? You probably want to be like, hey, I'm like 99.99999% sure that this is going to work, right? They, they want you to be very confident in those those uh, results or in, your, in those recommendations. So does that make sense? So nominal is the more kind of the umbrella term. So dichotomous would be like red, blue, right? Um, but for instance, if I was looking at, say, traffic lights, and I said, you know, uh, green, yellow, red, um, that could still be nominal variables. Again, there's no relationship between those. It's, and I can make as many categories as I want. You know, I could say uh, dog, cat, possum, raccoon, squirrel, you know. So you can have as many nominal variables as you want. Um, but when you say dichotomous, it's usually just referring to two. Right, so if you're a cat person versus a dog person, or whatever happens to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's interesting. So again, when you're looking at uh, t-test, you're really comparing two different uh, groups, essentially, right? So doing the caffeine versus the cocaine, like that would be fine. Now, if today I segregated you guys into three groups, and I say I did placebo, caffeine, and then cocaine, 
you can't really do a t-test, right? Because I would have to do uh, these two groups compared together, and then I have to do these two groups compared together, and I have to do these two groups compared together, right? So you, there's too many comparisons there. And what we know is that as you do more comparisons, what happens? Increase your type 1 error rate, right? Because you're just more likely to find something just by chance alone. If your chances are already 1 in 20 that you're going to reject the null hypothesis, uh, erroneously, uh, the more and more times I do it, the more likely you are to, you know, even a, a blind squirrel finds a nut, right? So the more and more uh, comparisons you make, essentially you're going to find something, um, you're going to reject that null hypothesis when you probably shouldn't have. So what we can do instead is to use something like an ANOVA, which basically will allow us to do things like three groups I can compare together. Essentially, I can look at all three together, compute one p-value to say, like, is there a difference between any one of these groups, and I can still use that p-value of 0.05, essentially. Um, once I find that that is, that yes, there is a statistically significant difference between one of these sets of groups, what do I do afterwards? That's when I have to start doing those multiple comparisons tests, right? So basically what you do is you end up calculating what a new alpha value is. Basically you take that 0.05 and generally what happens, and there's probably way more complicated ways to do it, but you divvy up that 0.05 amongst all the different um, comparisons you're going to make. So your p or your alpha value may now drop down to say like 0.005, right? If you're doing a ton of comparisons. Uh, and so in order to achieve, achieve significance, they have to be much more, more likely to be unlikely due to chance alone, right? So that's how we uh, avoid that multiple uh, comparison trap. Because as a group, altogether, that p-value should be 0.05, essentially, or that, that alpha level should be 0.05. So we call that kind of a family-wise error rate, essentially. Everyone with me? That's where that Bonferroni equation comes, or uh, Bonferroni uh, calculation comes in, right? Not the San Francisco tree. That's how we make sure we uh, factor in for multiple comparisons. Right, any other questions? Is this helpful? Hopefully, good. All right. I, I think actually looking at a true like example in the literature is the the most helpful thing. So let's go ahead and get into uh, this article, which was let's see, is intubation of profoundly agitated patients treated with pre-hospital ketamines. I actually saw this at a uh, webinar. One of the authors was presenting their their research, um, talking about this. So essentially, what what was the the study? If anyone can like kind of summarize it very quickly for me, just like kind of the um, what was the intervention? Why were we looking at this? Anyone tell me? They were trying to see if this could make the process go less lethargic and if it, everyone who used it should be intubated. And that was on like no ventilated or if there's higher rates of ventilation. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, so they're basically saying is that uh, are we having higher rates of intubation or have we, are we having changes in intubation rates based on the fact that we have this pre hospital ketamine that we're giving? So has anyone ever heard of ketamine before? Anyone know its street name? Special K, right? Going to the K hole. It, it kind of it's has a uh, a very kind of notorious history. Uh, it's a veterinary anesthetic as well. It can kind of give it to horses and knock them out. Uh, but it was used as a date rape drug for a while. And so uh, one of the kind of the pluses for that for that nefarious purpose was the fact that it did not uh, knock your respiratory drive down. And so a lot of the sedatives that we give to people. Things like benzodiazepines, things like barbiturates, things like propofol. Uh, Michael Jackson, like what well, he died from propofol. Um, those all depress the respiratory drive. And when you do that, who has to breathe for them at that point? We do, right? So we have to intubate the patient and put them on a ventilator, right? So the, one of the nice things about ketamine is you can give this drug and it does not knock out your respiratory drive. This is why we use it for kids over at, at the ER in Nemours because we don't have to worry about the respiratory drive. We can reduce their fractures. We can do what we need to uh, by giving ketamine. It's a very, very good drug for that. So essentially, um, in what kind of setting were they giving ketamine? Pre-hospital. So I mean, who, who's giving it? Yeah, the ambulance, so EMS uh, personnel were, was administering this, and who were they giving it to? Agitated patients, right? And so that's going to be very important when we talk about definitions and how that can have a bias on uh, our study results, okay? So bias is going to be a huge thing we're going to talk about. And again, um, what can introduce bias into our results? It's a term for things that can interfere with those results. So certainly biological variation. But say there's something like I didn't account for that are influencing my results. Confounders, yeah, so confounders is a, is a really important term as well. Seeing, did they take into account confounders? Did they address confounders? That's a really important thing to look at when you're evaluating a piece of literature, right? Because again, do you just want to read the abstract and take this as as verbatim, you know, say, hey, this is the true results? Never do that, never just read the abstract. You want to make sure you get down to the nitty gritty, but something that could actually change your practice, right? So it's a really, really important point there is not just to read the abstract. 
Anywho, so basically, you know, these, these EMS personnel, they were responding to calls where we had these agitated patients, right? And what's the problem with having an agitated patient? They're dangerous, right? They're dangerous to themselves. They can be a danger to others. Can you imagine being in the back of an ambulance with someone who's high on, uh, uh, you know, PCP or amphetamines or something? That's a dangerous situation to be in, right? Because those people can get very violent. They don't realize just how strong they actually are. And they've, I've seen people, you know, rip things out of walls and punch holes through uh, things that would be very, very difficult, you know, obviously breaking bones in the process because they just don't understand what they're doing, right, in a lot of cases. Obviously, not all these are drug-related. Some of it could be infectious disease-related. There's lots of, lots of factors that go into this. But essentially, EMS personnel were giving ketamine pre-hospital. You guys didn't know how they were giving it? Did you see that? Yeah, they're giving IM doses of ketamine. Uh, and again, route can be really important because you can see how that'll have an effect on, on um, potential things like intubation rates and, and whatnot. But basically, they're giving IM doses pre-hospital, and then they get into the hospital, right? And then what are they looking for at that point? Yeah, they get intubated, right? And so we'll look at some of the, the confounders there and some of the, the limitations, right? So limitations are always really, really important to address when you're, when you're doing a study um, because, again, you can't control for everything. So, again, uh, the abstract is good to get a basic kind of high-level uh, overview of an article. You can get some details, but, again, oftentimes what you'll find is that there can be discrepancies. You can look at the results of, a, of an article, go back and look at the abstract, and actually find that they something they said was uh, not statistically significant in the actual body of the article, they, they say is significant up top, right? And so it could, sometimes there are changes in the review process um, where you make a change, you forget to change something else. Like, you know, it's, it's uh, more common than you might think. So be very careful uh, just taking anything off of the, the abstract alone. Uh, it's always funny because, like, my wife, she's a, a pharmacist as well, uh, as I probably mentioned, um, but she'll say, like, hey, I saw this article where blah, blah, blah happened. I was like, well, did they, account, you know, taking into account this confounder? Did they do this? Did you just read the abstract? She gets very, very mad when I do that. So um, <laughs> don't do that to your significant other there in the, the medical field. Anyway, okay, so let's go ahead and look at the actual thing here. So again, um, basically they, they start off, they're talking about statement of the problem. That's what you're going to find in a lot of these articles is they don't just jump into the study. They want to say, why is this important? Why should you care about what they were they were interested in, right? So why do they uh, come up to this problem in the first place? What, what was the reason for doing the study? So again, they, they say profound agitation represents a significant risk to patients and providers. Absolutely. Um, you know, if you can't do chemical sedation, which is things like benzodiazepines or propofol or ketamine in this case, um, what are your other options? Physical restraints, right? So you can tie, you can basically hog tie them essentially uh, to a, a stretcher. Um, are there any inherent risks to that? Do you think <clears throat> they can injure themselves? Um, you can see increased kind of muscle breakdown, which can lead to things like rhabdo, which could be already happening in some of these cases. Um, you'll find that also they tend to get more acidotic, which again, these patients already have a problem with their acidotic to begin with. We'll look at some lab values a little bit later on. Um, but you know, a lot of times you don't want to use physical restraints. Um, it's kind of seen as kind of an inhumane thing. It's kind of a big deal. So you'll see there's a lot of documentation that goes into uh, physical restraints in the hospital setting because it's it's really a big deal because again, no one wants to be held against their their will essentially, right? And so these people essentially are against their will, even though they're not really in the right frame of mind. So we use chemical sedation in a lot of cases. And we mentioned that the nice thing about ketamine is it does not hit the respiratory drive. So what you would expect your null hypothesis to be is that ketamine would have basically no effect on, on intubations, right? That would, that, would be the, that would be your assumption of what the null hypothesis would be. So anyway, the other thing they'll typically do kind of early on in the uh, article and kind of introduction is they'll look at some of the previous literature. And so they'll see things like, hey, ketamine's been emerging as a potentially useful agent. Um, you know, we'll look a little bit at how ketamine use has changed over time and, and some of the results here. Um, but basically, we don't have a ton of evidence about pre-hospital use, right? So it's a relatively new thing than, say, the past 10 years or so. Um, and so this is where we're starting to get new information about it. We need to, to do this kind of literature to see, you know, if this, this is going to inform either future studies or in, inform future practice, essentially, right? So, all right, so anyway... Um, Again, they kind of state their purpose here. They sought to define the rate of intubation in profoundly agitated patients receiving pre-hospital ketamine at high, greater than 5 mg per kilo, or low, less than 5 mg per kilo doses, and describe clinically important outcomes, right? So that's basically the, their, their purpose, what they're trying to do. And now we can get into the kind of the study design and see the nitty-gritty of how they're actually going to do that, right? So um, I try to pick something at least kind of interesting, like agitated patients and give them the drugs, like, so hopefully it's not, like, totally boring you to death. I could have gotten something really esoteric, but... Figure this is at least kind of exciting, at least in, if you imagine it in your mind. Um, so anywho, so getting into study design. Okay, so let's start off. First sentence here. This was a retrospective cohort study of all patients who received pre-hospital ketamine for control of profound agitation per a predefined EMS protocol. Okay, so starting off with, what do you? Uh, the first thing you said there. Retrospective versus prospective. What's the difference? Uh, 
The retrospective is looking backwards in time. Prospective would be looking forwards in time. Absolutely. Okay, great. So, um, and what do they mean by cohort study? Yeah, basically they're looking at a specific group of patients. Now, um, if you were doing something like a case control study, how do you think this would differ? Because again, a lot of case control studies are oftentimes looking retrospectively as well, right? This is basically the only way you can do those type of studies. Um, sometimes you'll see prospective cohort studies, but those are probably less common uh, in, in some cases. But basically what you see, if you had a case control study, you start with the person who's your case, right? So say like the person who got ketamine, and then you may compare them with several people who did not get ketamine. Those are your controls, right? So maybe people who are presenting to the ER for agitation who did not get ketamine versus those that presented uh, with, uh, who did get ketamine. And essentially you try to match several control patients to one case um, to try to uh, account for confounders, right? So maybe, you know, things like drug intoxication or ethanol levels or gender or weight or different things like that. Um, you try to match them on several things because that will help to reduce what? Bias, yeah. So it helps to uh, account for those confounders and reduce bias, right? So that would be a case control study. And essentially you say, okay, well, here's the outcome, whether or not, say, or in some cases you may say, like, well, they got intubated or they didn't get intubated. And then you look retrospectively to say, like, well, what were the risk factors that possibly led them to have that outcome, right? And again, when you're looking at true causal cause and effect relationship, can you determine that from a retrospective study? You really can. That's actually one of those caveats that you don't, um, that is really important to keep in mind. This is going to be looking at observances, right? This is more of an observatory study. You can't really extract cause and effect from this, right? You can just say, this is what happened. Here's what we think. But we really need to do a prospective, usually a randomized controlled trial is really the most strong evidence you can have of cause and effect, right? So again, when you look at different um, sects of the literature, like, you know, things like cardiology, you can do huge, massive studies with thousands and thousands of people that are randomized controlled, double-blind trials. And those are very, very good levels of evidence to say, like, yes, we really think that by giving this drug, you're going to reduce your, your risk of death, right? Or by reducing your cholesterol, you're going to reduce this kind of cardiac outcome. In a lot of cases, though, for uh, stuff like this, you have to do retrospective or observatory studies because, again, is it uh, ethical to have these agitated patients, to, to make them agitated in the first place, and then decide to give them ketamine versus not ketamine? Hard to do those studies, right, um, because either of ethical issues or, or things like that. So oftentimes these are going to be more kind of convenient samples, and which is why we call these a, a cohort, right? So we're looking at this cohort of patients who are presenting uh, very agitated and got pre-hospital ketamine. Okay, so that's our cohort we're looking at. And again, we're not necessarily comparing them to a different group. We're just taking people who had uh, this this particular um, uh, this type, particular type of patient with these risk factors, and then we're seeing what the outcomes are, right? So that's a, basically the difference there between a case control study versus a cohort study. Make sense? Okay. And if you can look at it different examples, and you'll see it'll make more sense in their study design, and you can look at that. Like, okay, I can see how that's a case control versus a cohort. But this is a cohort. We're looking at patients. We're looking at, uh, okay, these are people that got ketamine, and then we're seeing what kind of outcomes happen with them. So anyway, um, so again, no randomization here, no control trial. Not some people got ketamine, some people got placebo. Again, so that level of evidence to show true cause and effect is going to be very limited in these cases. Okay, so uh, basically, they're going to see the EMS uh, protocol. We'll talk about that and how that can be a potential confounder in just a minute. Um, and they're uh, people who are transported to an urban county hospital. So the question is, well, where was that urban county hospital, right? Because again, if it was in say uh, Los Angeles. That could be different than if it was in, say, New York City versus where we're actually going to find is if you look down the, in the study setting of population, you can get that information. So basically what you find is a level one urban trauma center, uh, and I believe this was in Minnesota. Let me look. It was at the bottom of that Yeah, so, sorry, yeah, so the Minnesota, uh, so was at the bottom of that? I forgot to highlight it. Right where your pointer is. Right where my pointer is. Right. Uh, there, yeah, okay. Um, well, that was part of the EMS information thing. Oh, I'm sorry, here we go. So Hennepin County Medical Center, there we go. Um, right, so this is in Minnesota, right? So things like, you know, the reasons why patient, patients are agitated could be very different depending on, on where you're practicing at. So it's important to think about the generalizability. And when I say that, what do I mean by that? Yeah, or how can I apply it to my population or my people that I'm really worried about? So is the information coming from uh, Minnesota, is that going to be applicable to people in Florida? What would you think in this case? 
Probably, right? There's probably going to be some overlap, right? Some of this is going to be drug related, some of this is going to be infectious disease related. Um, now, for instance, you're going to find a lot of studies that, uh, especially for like a lot of my talk stuff, like a lot of that comes out from um, places like Taiwan. Uh, you'll see a lot of like Middle Eastern countries. Um, you see a lot of uh, Asian countries. And so then the question is like, well, is that really generalizable? Or do we have the same type of patients that we're dealing with? Are there genetic differences that are going to be uh, playing a role here? But again, these are, you know, Midwest Americans, probably going to be pretty similar across the country in, in regards to their response to ketamine, I would say, right? So again, location probably not going to be super important here, but keep that in mind of where these studies are being performed at, right? So, um, all right, and basically they, they have to state what kind of time frame they're looking for. So they're looking at these patients from uh, 2010 up through 2013. And keep in mind, this is like a 2017 article, I believe. 2016 or 2017. And again, sometimes it takes time to kind of collate all that information and to get an idea for a study and then to perform the uh, the, the um, retrospective study. So sometimes you'll find kind of a lap here between the, the data and then when you can actually uh, perform, you know, do the study and get it published and all that. The, the publishing, has anyone ever been published before? It's a hellacious process full of lots of different reviews and takes several, several months to a year plus in some cases. And so by the end of it, you're just like, I just want to get this thing out of my life, be done with it, get rid of it. I don't care what it says anymore. I'm done. Um, so hopefully some of you guys will get to experience that someday. It's fun. Anywho, um, also note uh, here that we have the Governing uh, Office for Human Subjects Research uh, approve this study. So why is this important here? So this is um, basically saying that we had someone, uh, kind of an ethics review board, review the study to make sure we were not doing anything unethical, right? Um, oftentimes, you're going to find a lot of institutions will talk about the IRB. That's the um, uh, Institutional Review Board. Uh, where essentially, they will go and look at studies that are being proposed, and they'll say, hey, this is really unethical. We're not going to do this study. Or, hey, change these things, and this will make it more ethical, right? So basically, their, their primary goal is to make sure um, that it is uh, uh, looking out for the patients first, essentially. Sometimes you'll find this kind of a multi-person, uh, um, kind of multi-discipline kind of organization. Sometimes you have someone out from the community. You have medical people. Um, you have more scientific people. Like They'll all kind of get together and, and review these studies. So it's like it's really important, especially over at Nemours, our IR because again, we're, when dealing with kids, that's a, uh, very much a, a kind of uh, very, very fraught with with uh, ethical uh, dilemmas there, and you want to make sure that you're doing right by the, the children. And so, a lot of studies um, will get shut down very early by the IRB review process. So again, it's important that they, they state that to say that hey, this was reviewed and this is okay. Now, how easy do you think it is to do uh, like an ethics review for a retrospective study where you're just looking at data versus like kind of a prospective uh, study where you're actually like intervening and giving people different uh, interventions? really easy to do retrospective. So if you guys were ever to do a study uh, somewhere, it's really easy to do retrospective because, again, the data is already there for the most part. You just have to go and collect it. And so it's very unlikely to be a risk for patients because you're not actually doing anything to them. So that's kind of one thing you may know if you ever uh, go down the, the, the research route. So anyway, all right, so we're looking at a level one urban trauma center. Uh, so level one, is that the lowest or the highest? That's the highest, right? So it's kind of funny because, like, for PEDS trauma, it actually goes, or I'm sorry, for NICUs, it goes opposite. So if you're, like, a neonatal intensive care unit, level three is, like, the best. Level one trauma center is, like, the best. It's, like, you know, uh, top dog is where all, like, you know, the really bad traumas end up getting uh, shunted over to. But, again, they uh, have more than 100,000 annual ED visits. They usually say, you know, how many people are coming through their ED and a lot of these type of studies. And basically trying to say, hey, this is a pretty generalizable group, right? Because they have a very um, uh, diverse patient population, 50 different languages being spoken. Trying to say, hey, we have kind of a wide berth of people here that we're, we're treating. It's probably going to be generalizable to whoever you're trying to treat as well, you know. So anyway, uh, basically they were talking about the EMS groups. Uh, and then they get down to the, the study protocol essentially here, okay? So basically... Um, they were working on this EMS group that had their pre-hospital protocol, right? And so we'll look at some of the definitions for that in a second. Um, basically, they, they decided whether or not to give ketamine to these patients who were being considered severely agitated and then coming into the hospital, right? Um, now, the other important thing you always want to look at in this study is the, oops, goof that up. Uh, the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So what are, what are these? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you want to figure out who's going to be in your study and who's going to be excluded from your study. So that has a direct effect on generalizability, right? So if I were, for instance, going to exclude all female patients, I cannot generalize that information I got from all the male patients back to females. There could be some inherent difference there. Um, we know, you know, kinetics between men and women tend to change. Um, you know, lots of different factors can come into it, right? Or, for instance, in this case, who do they exclude? Pregnant women, right? Because again, they are very, uh, it's very unethical to do studies on pregnant women generally. So they, uh, as, as most people tend to exclude them. Um, who else? People under 18, right? So children, again, is another protected group. You guys know any other like protected groups? 
Sometimes the elderly, it depends on, uh, usually it's, it's less difficult to get elderly patients in because, again, they, they are able to, these are patients who are able to give consent, right? So usually kids, are, you have to, um, it's a lot more difficult to get consent. You have to go through the parents, have assent from the patient, all that kind of stuff. But um, uh, uh, prisoners are another big one. You can't really do studies on prisoners because they're kind of a captive audience. Like they can't have any kind of uh, thought that they might have incentives for joining a study when, you know, it might shave off jail time or something like that. It, it's really unethical, so you can't do that. Anywho, um, so again, they were going to exclude patients who are less than 18. They're going to exclude pregnant women. Um, who else did they exclude? Patients that are doing it just for pain. Good, yeah, so if they're just doing it for pain, right? So if EMS gave it because of pain, because again, is that applicable to our, what we're curious about? No, because again, if we're, uh, and you typically see lower doses used for pain, less likely to be intubated. We really are interested in those agitated patients. Good, so we can exclude them. Who else? Okay, yeah, so if it was, uh, they received by someone else, that would be another good one. Anyone else? They were also excluding people who were transferred to other hospitals, right? So they wanted people who were going to be managed in that ER, um, so that way they had all the data there, right? So it could be one of those things where um, that could be important information because, you know, those people getting transferred out, like, they could be skewing the results one way or the other, right? So that could be an important confound that they should be addressing, saying, hey, you know, we had this many people transfer out. But uh, we'll look at that data here in just a few minutes to see. Why they got excluded here. Okay, so anyway, um, so again, therefore only non-pregnant greater than 18 years of age who received pre-hospital ketamine for control profound agitation were included in the study here. Good. So basically they will also go through and talk about how they get their records. So if, they're, if they have a specific type of software they use, they'll talk about that. Um, they'll talk about who reviewed these kind of the charts essentially. So again, when you have these retrospective uh, studies, you have to say who, who's actually reviewing it. So for instance, here, um, they said they had two authors and those are named up top. So they get their initials here at an EMS fellow. And then they had emergency medicine resident physician. And they were both kind of reviewing charts. And essentially, if they came up with any, um, uh, basically they had one oversight that was provided by the EMS medical director. And so if they had any discrepancies, they would go back to that person as kind of an adjudicator as, as far as how to categorize things, right? And so this is really important uh, because um, what kind of bias could you see being in, in brought in here at this point? Yeah, exactly. So in reviewing the chart, is there some subjectivity there, right? So you're trying to be as objective as possible, but you realize that if you ever go through like hospital charts and things like that, sometimes the documentation is not great, right? Or if you're dealing with EMS run sheets, right? So EMS run sheets are basically the documentation the EMS guys are using uh, that they will get delivered to the hospital. Um, and so those may not be super great, right? Depending on how busy the guys were, you know, if they're dealing with a super combative patient, like how top priority is your documentation? probably going down a few notches there, right? So um, it's really important to look at who is uh, reviewing the data to make sure they are, you know, um, qualified to do so. So I think EMS fellow, um, you know, emergency medicine resident, they're probably pretty good at, at reviewing those sort of things. Um, and then the question is, you know, is there, are they synchronous? Like, would they review the same chart the same way? And so there's actually tests that you can do for that. There's, uh, if you ever hear like a kappa value, we'll talk about that. But basically, uh, they did not do this here. So that could be one potential criticism for the article saying, that, hey, you didn't actually do the test to compare to see, would these two guys look, review the same chart the same way? So there could be some discrepancies in that, and that could induce bias, right? That can uh, introduce bias into the study results. Probably not a big deal here, but that's something to consider. Um, I had this problem as well. My uh, big fellowship research that we did was on coral snake bites, and it was a ton of like retrospective case review. And so it was me doing half the cases, and it was an EMS, uh, or I'm sorry, um, ER uh, resident who was doing the other half, right? And so we actually didn't do that test either to see if we were um, rating them reliably. Um, but it's one of those things where you know if we had discrepancies, we could always go to the third person or our usual medical director, and they can kind of give us the, the okay, right? Um, so that's an important thing that you'll see there. Okay, um, other things to note, data censoring, right? So what does censoring data mean? Yeah, we're just not going to include it in the results, right? So this is really important because sometimes those things can be skewing your data. We saw there's a few examples of that in, in the lecture. Um, so they did things like physiologically implausible vital signs. So if you had a diastolic above your systolic, it's probably not right, right? It's probably something that was documenting correctly, you read it wrong. Or if you had like a temperature of 9.8 degrees Fahrenheit, it's pretty chilly. Um, so your patient would probably be in the morgue at that point. So uh, again, things like that were probably just misdocumented, and so they would exclude those values, okay? Could be important, but in most cases, it's probably just a mistake, and uh, you're probably fine to do that. But again, it could be a potential um, uh, bias there, okay? And then uh, basically, they're only looking at ED data. Um, let's see. 
Okay, and so again, they're, they're talking about the run sheets and, and actual hospital data they're looking at. So again, um, oh, also here they're talking about they actually had to match the hospital records back to the EMS run sheet. So if there's a mistake and they maybe um, got two patients mixed up, that could be a potential bias there, right? Because that could skew your results one way or the other. Um, so again, just be careful with those sorts of things. Okay. Uh, next up, they looked at the measurements. So how are they actually going to measure this stuff? So um, they talked about the paramedic case impression, which is that objective, subjective? What do you think about that? Very subjective, right? So again, anytime you're having a human being involved in the decision of something, that was going to be somewhat subjective. And so that's important to consider there. Um, talk about the ketamine dose they're measuring in the route, whether they got IV or IM. Um, again, why do you think IM is better for these type of patients? They're agitated. Agitated. How easy to get an IV on an agitated patient? Yeah, they're going to rip it out or they're going to fight you. They probably need to be in physical restraints to even do that. No good. So IM is very easy to do. Um, just jab into the thigh and good to go, right? Um, talk about time of presentation, uh, additional pre-hospital sedations where they got haloperidol, which this is an old school antipsychotic. We call it vitamin H. Uh, and then going down here, we'll go back to that table in a second. And midazolam, which is a, a benzodiazepine, so the, otherwise known as Versed, if you ever heard of that. So uh, basically, they were looking for those sorts of information. Um, they're talking about the protocol, and we'll look at that in just a second. But um, they were looking at the IM dose, whether, and they, again, they were going to start to get into some of these more categorical type of uh, variables here where they were looking at, you know, they didn't look at specifically the ketamine dose. They were looking at greater than five milligrams or less than five milligrams per kilo, right? So again, you're going to see that they will take these continuous variables and sometimes lump them into more ordinal or uh, nominal uh, categories, right? So again, in the case of less than five or greater than five, would that be ordinal or nominal? That would be ordinal, right? Because there's actually a relationship there. Greater than five is bigger than less than five essentially, right? So kind of keep those type of uh, things in mind. So then, um, again, case impressions uh, the, are the basis of which the treatment is initiated. Um, so again, the question is like, you know, did these EMS guys, were they, ag you know, correctly identifying these patients as being agitated? And we'll look at that definition in just a second. They also were collecting additional data, right? So they can, and this is going to be important when they get to the, the uh, logistic regression that they did, and they're talking about making a model. Because remember that model, models we were talking about? What are models used for besides displaying your new clothes. They help us to predict things, right? They help us to develop this uh, this mathematical model that we could potentially apply out to other patients, or we could look at to, to look at some other um, potential um, comparisons. Yeah, so if you, um, so essentially, uh, again, with ordinal, there's an inherent order between the two, right? So there's an inherent uh, difference in the values. Um, so with less than five versus greater than five, Right, so less than five is obviously less, so that would be considered ordinal in that in that case, right? Isn't it like nominal one or two situations? Right, so you can have ordinal that's only two variables, right? So the important thing is the actual characteristics of the the variable, and not necessarily just how many of them there are, right? So I can have ordinal values. I can have ten different. I could have had uh, less than one milligram per kilogram. I had between one and two milligrams per kilogram, right? I'm not looking at the actual continuous value, right? But I'm lumping them into categories. Okay, but because there's an inherent relationship, one's greater than the other, I can call that ordinal, right? Okay, so anyway, uh, so going on, let's see. So again, they're looking at things like uh, ethanol levels, so why would that be important to intubation? <coughs> ethanol can depress your, your respiratory drive, right? So just again, it's a CNS uh, depressant, so if someone had a lot of ethanol on board, maybe that predisposes them to being in intubated, right? So that's an important thing to look at. When you can look at these confounders, we can start to take some of these things into account, right? Um, looking at things like venous or arterial pH, look at urine toxicology screens, um, all these different da uh, data points you're going to look at to see are any of these having an effect on the results that we're seeing here. And that's where they're going to get back when we look at that uh, logistic regression model uh, in just a few minutes. Okay, so this is uh, basically the EMS pre-hospital profound agitation protocol. So this is, again, EMS guys are usually working off protocol. They don't really work independently. Usually the, the medical director has, has uh, deigned that these are the protocols you'll work under, and then they'll make clinical decisions based off of these protocols, <laughs> essentially, right? Um, so again, if they have a profoundly agitated patient with active physical violence to himself or herself or others evident, and usual chemical or physical restraints may not be appropriate or safely used to consider. So at this point, what do you notice here? So they have other drugs available, right? They have things like haloperidol. They have things like midazolam. They have ketamine. They are now making a decision. Do I think that this person would be would not work well with haloperidol or Versed? Yes. 
Should I give them ketamine instead, right? So now you're starting to see some sub subjectivity here, right? So depending on who's working that night or who's working that day or whatever, uh, whoever's responding, they may have very different um, patients uh, get ketamine versus get midazolam, right? So that's an inherent uh, confounder there already is that the person is now making a decision. Um, how is that affecting the results there, right? So again, some people love ketamine. I love ketamine. I think it's a great drug. I'd probably give it to all my agitated patients, right? Um, some people are not, they don't like change, right? They don't like to use any kind of the newer drugs. They may always give Haldol. So that can, again, change who, what patients are actually going to be in, in, included in the study in the first place. So that could be a potential confounder to look at. And again, um, they look at uh, giving ketamine, usually five milligrams per kilo IM. Uh, if they have an IV established, which is pretty rare, as you'll see in the results, um, they would maybe give two mg per kilo IV or uh, what's this route here? Intraosseous, yes, that's another good quick way to get IV access if you, if you really had to. But again, pretty difficult to get a power drill onto an agitated patient. But um, <clears throat> and again, they already tell you, do not attempt to place an IV in a severely combative patient because they'll probably try to punch you. Anyway, um, all right, so if the ketamine's administered, then you're going to uh, move, it basically kind of goes through the, the rest of the information, um, talking about different things they'll do based on if the patient gets apneic, if they, uh, and when to intubate, when to give different drugs to, to counteract side effects and all that. But again, I just kind of wanted to point out here the, the subjectivity now we're introducing into the study into who is going to actually get um, ketamine. It's based on uh, the EMS personnel, their decision, who's agitated, and should the, are these other drugs not going to be effective for them, essentially, right? Okay, so again, um, this is also kind of interesting. I'm looking at other potential confounders. I try to put these in green uh, where I have them. But basically, um, they were saying where patient weight from the encounter was not recorded immediately, the most proximal weight documented within one month of presentation was used to estimate weight-based dosing. So is that a potential confounder? I think I marked it in green. It must be. Yeah, so in some of these patients, they actually did not have weight available for the patients, right? Because, again, getting weight in some of these guys could be pretty difficult unless they're, like, on a stretcher uh, that has, like, a scale built into it. And so for some of the results, they actually don't have data for some of those patients. I think it was, like, 30-some-odd patients you'll see that didn't have weight data associated with them. That can that can skew your data, right? Because then at, when you're trying to categorize people as getting less than or greater than 5 mg per kilo, that's a whole bunch of people we can't do that, that um, analysis for. So you'll see that was a form of data censoring for those particular analyses where they would cut out those patients that didn't have weights uh, available, right? So again, that's a potential confounder skewing your results, okay? Yes? Um, they will either ask uh, family members or they will eyeball the kind of, mm, you maybe weigh this much. Um, usually for adult patients, that's... You, you have a lot more kind of uh, margin for error for adult patients in a lot of cases. For kids, you might do things like, you guys ever heard of a Braslow tape? A Braslow tape is basically this big um, kind of tape you'll uh, unfold, and you'll basically put it up against the, the kid on a stretcher, and they'll correspond to a particular color, and that will correspond to uh, weight, basically. So, again, um, we'll talk about that in the PED section uh, in, in farm, but essentially that's one way that you could estimate pediatric weights if you didn't have that available. But anyway, I mean, you try to get a uh, best of guess as you can, right? So again, another area for confounding, right? So if they misguessed the patient's weight and they end up giving, but that's why they kind of <laughs> used the in-hospital weight and then looked back and see the dose that they got and they were able to figure out, you know, how many makes per kilo they got essentially, if the weight was available. So again, that's one thing. Um, the other big thing, and I think this is really important, is looking at the indications for intubation, right? So we'll look at uh, some confounders here, but again, no list of uniformly accepted indications for intubation of the agitated patients utilized at the receiving institution. So that basically means the, the provider, they are able to intubate for whatever reason they want. If they think the patient looks apneic, <laughs> if they look at them funny, um, they can intubate for whatever reason they want, right? And so that's important because you may find that different providers will work differently. Like, so you'll find that some people will be much more likely to intubate, some people will be much less likely. And so that can, again, skew your results one way or the other, okay? Okay, so again, getting into uh, some data analysis. Uh, we'll take a break in just a few minutes. I'll, I'll tell you, cover this section. Okay, so um, right here, notice we're using descriptive statistics. What do you think that means? We're just describing stuff, right? We're just using statistics to kind of tell us the description of the, the, the data that we're getting from this sample here. Um, so, uh, and again, some of these tests, I even I have to look up because there's things you don't see a whole uh, very often. Um, they were using the Shapiro-Wilk method, which I had to look up, and that was actually a test for normality. You guys remember what uh, uh, tests from normality help us to do? Hmm? Yeah, they're telling us whether we're sampling from uh, a Gaussian distribution or a non-Gaussian or non-normal distribu uh, distribution, right? So why is that important? changes the type of test we're going to use, right? So again, when you use, uh, when you're dealing with data from a Gaussian distribution, we call that parametric or non-parametric. You can use parametric tests for those patients, right? And this is super key because if you're dealing with the wrong type of data, um, if, you're, if you're making assumptions about that, then you can lead to some erroneous um, uh, conclusions, right? 
So if you have a normally distributed set of data, I can use parametric tests like t-tests, right? I can use um, things, uh, ANOVAs, things like that because I'm using the assumption that this is a normally distributed um, set of data. In this case, what they actually found was that um, they uh, basically had a non-normal set of data, right? Because again, this is a convenient sample. It's not like a randomly sampled uh, group of people have a, a, out of the, the population. You have people presenting agitated. So they tended to not really be normally distributed. So in that case, we have to switch over to use what type of test? Hmm? Well, not non-parametric uh, test, right? What did you say? We will talk about that in a second. Yeah, um, you have to switch over to using non-parametric tests, though, so that changes. And so now instead of using something like a t-test, you might use something like a Mann Whitney U test or a Wilcox and Rank Sum test. Um, so there's a different set of tests, and that's why those on uh, that last PowerPoint, there's two different slides for that. So there's parametric versus non-parametric tests you should be aware of, right? And again, if we talked about it in the lecture previous, then that, that will be game for for the test. So, so they found, okay, this did not pass the test for normality, so we're going to go with non-parametric tests. And what that basically means is instead of using averages, right, and using averages with, like, standard deviations, what they're going to do instead is use medians in the interquartile ranges, right? And the median is basically what? The middle value, right? So it's the 50th percentile, essentially. And then the interquartile ranges would be what? 25th and 75th percentile, essentially, right? So again, you're looking at the 50th percentile, 25th and 75th percentile. And so by using that, uh, basically you uh, end up using your non-parametric test. They basically will rank the values um, uh, and they will use that information in order to, to calculate p-values and whatnot. And that makes sense because basically they said that they use these univariate analyses, which basically mean that they're just looking at one variable at a time uh, to describe the association between uh, intubation and baseline demographic, uh, demographic values, right? And they're going to use a Mann-Whitney U-test. And that makes sense, right? Because you'll, if you look on that uh, chart, you'll see that Mann-Whitney U-test falls into the non-parametric test. So that would make sense, right? If they said, hey, we're going to use a, a t-test to evaluate this non-parametric data, that wouldn't really work, right? And so the problem with that is, is that you are, it's much easier to achieve significance with parametric tests than non-parametric tests, okay? That's kind of a general rule of thumb. And so if I were to use parametric tests for this kind of data that's not normally distributed, then I'm more likely to find something of significance, and that means I'm more likely to make what type of error? Type 1 error, right? I don't want to do that. So again, using non-parametric tests is usually the easier way to go about, as uh, we call that more robust, right? So it means it's more uh, unlikely to cause a type 1 error due to the assumptions that I'm working under. Okay, so again, it's usually a safer bet that if you really find significance with non-parametric tests, usually pretty good to go, right? So you, you usually can be pretty confident in those results. Um, they also use uh, Pearson's chi-square test and Fisher's exact chi-square test. The only uh, real difference here uh, is that a, a Fisher's exact uh, test is when you have really low um, numbers. Because again, what's a chi-square test supposed to do? Hmm? Yeah, so we use it for usually like ordinal or like nominal data, but it helps us to look at observed versus expected frequencies, right? So basically you make these kind of contingency tables uh, and you will compare uh, what actually happened versus what you would expect to happen by chance alone and see if there's a, a significant difference there, right? And so that's what a chi-square test is really good for. If you have, you have different flavors of it essentially. And so if you have really small sample sizes, you might use a, a Fisher's exact test. Um, but again, for our purposes, just know what a chi-square test is used for kind of generally. Okay, so so that all makes sense. So that all seems pretty appropriate, at least from from our standpoint. Um, and again, you know, the a test question may come up where it says, "Hey, you know, we're trying to do this type of study. We're using these type of variables. What test would be most appropriate for that?" Right? And so you'd say, "Okay, that sounds like a paired t-test versus an unpaired t-test, or um, you know, chi-square test versus you know, um, logistic regression, or something like that." So kind of be familiar with those sorts of things and where, where one might be appropriate versus the other. Okay, so. Um, all right, so that's it for data analysis. Any questions so far? Everyone's head spinning a little bit? That's okay. Let's take a 10-minute uh, break. We'll come back, and we'll continue on with this fun stuff. Okay, so everyone good on the break. Now their heads are... Uh, Kind of stop spinning, or at least have reached a reduced RPM. Hopefully, and continue on. Okay, so let's start with the results of our study. We kind of looked at how are they going to uh, perform the study, how are they going to analyze the data, and let's look at the results. That's what we actually care about, right? Okay, so let's see here. So we had um, basically they'll start off by saying how many patients they had initially being evaluated. So they'll say pre-hospital ketamine was administered on 227 occasions. Now, is that how many people we have in the final analysis? No, right? Because we have to factor in our 
excluded patients. Absolutely. So we got to exclude patients. And what's interesting, they have here a single patient with recurrent episodes of encephal encephalopathic behavior was responsible for 38 out of 47 exclusions due to EMS transport to a different facility. That's, that's a, yeah, over three years, like that's a lot of times I have to get you know the EMS mm -hmm. called on you to receive ketamine. I think he just liked it at that point, uh, if I had to guess. But um, regardless, so again, that could be something to include, right? That's a, that's a potential confounder. Again, when you're and again, they don't actually address this, but when you include the same patient multiple times in the study, that can skew things, right? Because now you're looking at paired data, right? That can violate one of those assumptions of using something like the Man Whitney U test, which is an unpaired test. So again, that's something to consider that I didn't actually see addressed in the, in the in the article itself. So again, always think about these confounders. So uh, again, I'll look at the the tables now. These are a little bit easier to digest and just reading through. But basically, we had 227 doses pre-hospital ketamine administered, and you can see they broke it down by year. And kind of what do you notice um, as time goes on? Yeah, so again, as comfort with providers gets, uh, as it gets more comfortable giving it, they're going to give it more often typically. And this is what you see in a lot of cases where you have a new drug comes out, it gets very little use at first, and then as, it beca as people get more comfortable with it or price comes down or different things, you'll see it given more and more. So in 2010, they had only 22 doses given pre-hospital. They had one analgesic dose, so those are excluded. They had uh, four kids, uh, those are excluded, and then one person transported uh, to another facility. And so you can kind of see where the, the different... Um, uh, the different uh, exclusions come from, right? So at the end, we have 135 patients that we included for this analysis, okay? So that's our number that we're going to be using for most of these calculations is 135, okay? So then going down to the base of the flow sheet, you can see here how they actually break down the demographics of their patient, and notice how they're going to be breaking down based on whether they got intubated or not, okay? So looking at our intubated patients, you notice here, N is 85, not intubated, N is going to be 50 here. And we'll look to see, you know, this number, if you were just to look at the numbers, what would you conclude? Academy, people got academy are more likely to be intubated, right? Because the number is bigger, right? But we'll look at a statistical test to see is that due to chance alone or is this actually a statistically significant value? Okay, so we'll look at that in a second. But um, and again, it's always really important to look at the uh, the table to make sure you're evaluating it appropriately. So for instance, when you're looking at gender here, notice here the N is what's N? Yeah, the number of people following that category, and then uh, they'll have here, and, and usually what the, um, in this case, they're telling you the percentage essentially, right? So for males, we had 76 males, nine females, and you see that uh, the percentages here uh, being, uh, and again, if you were to look at this, what would you kind of notice? More males, right? Okay, so we have a lot more males. So maybe that could be another thing that we're going to look at to be a potential confounder, right? So again, why are males getting more ketamine? We'll look at some of those results, and that's one of the things we'll address in the uh, the discussion section, right? Uh, look at age. The age is pretty comparable. Um, look at the weight again here in kilograms, and again, note here this is only going to be for people who had weights uh, that were available, right? So that's going to be one of these little points down here. Data missing for 13 out of 50 unintubated patients and two out of 85. So that's a lot of people you're cutting out. Uh, from that that weight um, category in the unintubated group. So again, like, could that be skewing my results? Could, if I had included those 13 patients, would that have changed anything? That's a that's a fair uh, question to ask uh, when you're evaluating the literature. Again, heart rate is pretty uh, similar. Systolic blood pressure. Again, notice it's pretty high. Um, now again, this is actually um, one of the potential side effects of the drug. Not only are they agitated to begin with, which usually raises blood pressure and heart rate, uh, but also ketamine can do that as well, right? So that's kind of a known side effect because it increases catecholamine release. So again, that's going to be something to note there. Uh, notice the respiratory rate, pretty similar, and then uh, their oxygen saturation, okay? So we can look at these different things individually to see is there any statistically significant difference between uh, in, uh, the people in these groups, okay? So we're going to look at that in a second. And again, note here, uh, if you were to look at this, you know, note these are not confidence intervals. These are just interquartile ranges, and you would know that based on looking at here, it says interquartile range unless otherwise noted, okay? And again, these are median values, not average values. And why are we using median? Because it's not normally distributed data, right? Because again, we said that we're not going to go with the assumption that's normally distributed data where we'd use averages. We're going to go ahead and use medians instead. So this is probably the more accurate way to kind of present um, the information here, okay? So anyway, so going down, um, let's see here. They also had, uh, talking about explanations or rationale for decisions to intubate. And again, looking at here, a single indication uh, was referenced in, in some of these cases, but some patients actually had multiple reasons that the physicians uh, cited for wanting to intubate. And again, this is all based on physician preference, right? So if you see someone, because again, if, um, has anyone ever seen someone get ketamine before? Pretty cool. Basically, it's uh, basically kind of shutting off all input from the body up to the brain. And so even though they have their eyes open, they can blink. Um, you could 
cut them open, perform surgery on them, they're not going to they're not going to respond basically um, because you basically cut off all that input up to the the CNS. And so if you saw a patient like that who's just sitting there completely borked out of their mind, uh, they're still breathing, you might still feel pretty uncomfortable because that Glasgow Coma Scale, which a lot of people use to kind of compare um, you know levels of consciousness between patients, um, it's like that looks pretty low. I'm going to go ahead and intubate that guy. Right or that, that girl. In this case, it's more guys than girls, uh, as it happens to be. Um, otherwise, some people may be very familiar with ketamine and say, well, that's just how they look. I feel more comfortable watching that patient and not intubating right off the bat, right? Because again, airway is one of those things where if you're not sure about it, some people may be more prone just to do it, to just intubate and get them over with. So that way you don't have to worry about it later on. Because again, um, if you have chance to prepare for an intubation, it's gonna be a lot better situation than when you're doing it emergently, right? Because again, it's gonna be something that can go wrong, lots of complications associated with it. You'll learn about that later. Anywho, um, okay, so we're looking at, there's lots of different reasons. Uh, they're also looking at pre-hospital sedation that was administered. So you can see here um, how many people got Versed, how many people got Haldol in the respective groups. And so that is another potential confounder that you need to account for, essentially, okay? So um, here they have a table where they're just looking at, um, I believe these are pre-hospital intubations. Yeah, so these are cases of people who actually got intubated prior to um getting into the hospital. And again, that could be another potential confounder because now the EMS personnel are working off their protocols on who to intubate versus not. Okay. And again, like be very provider dependent, could be de dependent on their level of comfort with ketamine, things like that. So just keep that in mind. Okay. Um, all right. So looking at intubation rates here, see they were similar across groups receiving any or no adjunctive therapy. So that's good. So basically they're saying that sedatives did not appear to have any effect here. So basically they looked here and again, notice they said a uh, categorized the patients either getting pre uh, getting other sedation or not. Right. So again, this is going to be uh, kind of a nominal kind of variable here. Right. Because again, there's no actual numerical relationship between the two. So we can say, you know, one or the other, these are nominal. And so in this case, they saw, you know, 68.4% in the intubated group versus 62. They did a Pearson chi-square, right? Because then they're just looking at uh, expected versus observed frequencies, and they got a p-value of 0.595. So what does that mean to you? It's not statistically significant. This basically means that a value this extreme uh, from, you know, something that would be just completely normally distributed, um, you would say, you know, you have almost a 60% chance just finding these results by chance alone, right? So again, not that impressive, uh, probably just due to random chance. So that this appeared to not have an effect on whether or not patients got intubated. So that's one thing to note, right? So getting Versed or, or Haldol beforehand did not affect this, or at least uh, in these patients. The other thing they looked at, they were looking at 55 patients, uh, or 40.7% presented at the ED between the late night hours, so between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m., and you notice that the, uh, the intubation occurred in 74.6% of those patients versus 55% during daytime uh, patients. Now they're looking at time of day that the patient presented to see if that has any effect here. And so what do we see uh, with this result? Hmm? Yeah, so the p-value is 0 0.021, so that's less than 0 0.05, so they would consider that to be statistically significant, right? So that basically means is that patients who got intubated were more likely to show up at nighttime during the evening hours uh, than during the daytime. Now, why do you think that is? Right, so it's certainly it's a potential confounder, right? So some of those reasons, but why, why would you think that? Hmm? Okay, so that could be one reason. Maybe more people were kind of drunk as a skunk coming in and they need to be intubated. So we're, we can look at that. We can see did alcohol actually affect these results. What are the staff levels in a hospital like compared uh, overnight versus daytime? Lower, a lot lower. So again, a lot of these providers are more likely just to intubate the person so they don't have to worry about it later on, right? So again, um, their, their threshold to do that is going to be lower. They're more likely to intubate um, just so that way they can get the patient taken care of and then send them off to ICU or wherever they're going to go, right? Um, so that, that could be one reason that's, uh, you'll see that as again, um, nighttime, you know, you're kind of on your own in a lot of cases in, in some regards. And so you're, you're more likely to do things like that. Because again, it's going to lead you to less trouble later on. Uh, if you did, Because you know, again, it's not just these patients you're taking care of. Also, you know, cardiac arrest coming in and traumas and all those other things. So you want to make sure you don't have to worry about these guys uh, crumping on you later on. So that's, that's probably one of the reasons they, they discuss that in the, in the um, discussion section. Okay. So other things we're looking at, they saw that they went ahead and looked at pH value. So notice pH value, what, what is uh, pH? Is this, what type of variable is that? Continuous, yeah. So this is actually a continuous variable. And so you notice here they compared the pH values between those that uh, got intubated and those who didn't. And they noticed here when they did a man Whitney U test. So now again, this is a test, parametric test for continuous variables. What do we notice with the uh, p value here? Statistically significant, right? So they said that people got intubated had a lower pH, 
than those that uh, did not get intubated, right? So again, uh, this was statistically significant. So again, it's very unlikely due to chance alone, only 1.8% chance. In these cases, it doesn't really matter because you're just ranking them, right? So again, because it's a non-parametric test, you're using ranks, and so um, you can do ratios because again, you can have uh, the first rank is always going to be one, essentially the lowest value versus that. So you can kind of get around to that. So again, um, and again, a lot of cases, uh, you just kind of go with the assumption the patient or the uh, researchers are using um, the test appropriately versus if it's you know uh, ratio versus an interval uh, value. But anyway, so again, for this continuous test, it ended up being statistically significant. Then that, that kind of makes sense, right? So if patients are not oxygenating very well, they tend to get more acidotic, right? They're not breathing, they're not blowing off CO2. So that would, that would make sense, right? So that would, that would kind of back up thinking maybe they were having respiratory depression or something was causing them to be more acidotic, um, leading them uh, to have a higher um, uh, or lower pH, I should say, in, in group that got intubated, right? Okay. Um, also, urine tox screens are, are kind of interesting. I'm not going to go into a big diatribe about that, but um, urine tox screens are very unreliable because there's a lot of things that don't show up. A lot of things that show up uh, as false positives. And so they actually did not find any really uh, significant results here um, regarding that. So but anyway, I think you get to the more important stuff. Again, this is just another kind of descriptive table. This is not actually doing um, uh, any uh, actual comparisons, or what they'll sometimes do is they'll do these um, these type of tables, and they will note which ones happen to be um, statistically significant. So if you kind of notice here um, that for this uh, note A, notice here on the ethanol level, it said median concentration, including uh, those with the detectable levels. Um, let's see. Uh, that's actually not a good one. All right, I'm sorry. This is what I meant. Uh, uh, Subnote B here. Um, significant difference between groups. Man, Whitney, you test less than 0.05. So really, the only thing that showed up to be statistically significant difference between intubated versus not intubated was this venous pH. So that was the only thing you could say. All the other stuff, the bicarbonate levels, which again, that would if they had different pHs, you would think bicarbonate would change as well, but um, that did not happen. Uh, ethanol levels were similar between groups. Creatinine kinase was similar. Lactate, arterial pH. Um, really, only venous pH was the only thing that differed. And again, is this clinically significant? 7.25 versus 7.33? Probably not. It's probably not a huge difference there. Um, in this case, and again, you guys will kind of get a feel for that when you get out in natural rotations and things like that. This is probably not clinically super significant, but statistically still is significant. And so that's one of those things you have to kind of make a judgment call on as a, as a provider is whether or not it's clinically versus, because um, you can read it and say it's statistically significant. You have to decide whether it's clinically significant, essentially. Okay, uh, another good table here. Um, this is actually showing the, the milligram per kilogram ketamine doses um, of the patients. And so again, this is using uh, the median value. So again, remember these whisker or box plots I kind of talked about in one of the previous lectures, maybe. Um, again, so it's important to read uh, the stuff to make sure you know what the different, um, uh, the nomenclature here is. Because again, it can differ based on which study you're looking at. Sometimes they're using confidence intervals. Sometimes they're using um, uh, standard deviation. So in this case, what they're looking at is that you saw the, the, the diamond here is mean ketamine dose, right? You're going to see that the interquartile ranges are going to be the edges of the box. So 25th percentile versus 75th percentile. And then the whiskers are going to be 1.5 times the interquartile range. Right, so they just decided to do that. That's how they wanted to show the variability in the data that you're seeing there. And again, what do you notice um, with the variability in the dose that they're receiving? Who has more variation? Yeah, the intubated group. They tend to have a little bit more variation there. But again, clinically, probably not super significant because, again, everyone's kind of getting the same kind of weight-based 5 milligram per kilo dose. Uh, but when they actually did the weights in the hospital, they found that there was some, some variation there. And then there's these little dots here are going to be outliers. Again, we can do tests to figure out the, if those are true outliers or it's just due to random chance, but I won't, they didn't do that in, in this case here. So uh, they also looked at uh, impression. So these are the reasons why the providers decided to intubate these patients. And again, you can look at different, uh, they didn't actually do comparisons here to see if anything was significant. Um, and again, this is so subjective, it'd be hard to really pull any good data from that in the first place. So that was not um, super useful there. But again, um, can you tell a statistically significant difference here based on what's presented in this graph? Can't really, right? So unless you had something like confidence, so if you had a, a box, two boxes comparing confidence intervals, you could look at the overlap to determine their significance. But in this case with the interquartile ranges, this, you can't really uh, determine that. So again, it's important to know what you're looking at in the graph and what it can actually tell you. In this case, it's just kind of illustrating graphically what the variables are. Okay, so anyway, so going into the univariate analysis, they're gonna reveal the uh, statistically significant associations between intubation, both male gender, so they saw, okay, here's male gender, they had a Pearson's chi-square, and it ended up being 12.02, so men tend to be 12 
uh, one or two times more likely to um, uh, be intubated in this group, you know, in their observed frequencies versus the expected. And again, this is a very uh, small p-value. So why do you think that might be the case? Why do you think guys are more likely to get intubated versus females? They're more aggressive, possibly. Maybe uh, an idea that you know they may be more dangerous, they may be stronger, something like that. So there could be some provider um, sort of uh, subjectivity there to think like, hey, you know this you know 250 pound linebacker who's super agitated. Uh, I want to go ahead and sedate him because I'm worried about him trying to fight me versus you know a female patient, right? So there could be some some biases there in, in the providers and who gets the drugs and versus who doesn't. So that, that is again another confounder they they can look at in the discussion section. Um, looking at ED arrival time, again, we saw that that's going to be more likely to have patients that are going to show up uh, during the nighttime hours. So, again, those are more likely. Again, that was statistically significant. Um, let's see. What's interesting is they actually looked at rates of intubation between the, the low dose, less than 5 milligrams per kilo, versus the high dose. Again, this is all just going to be either nominal or ordinal data we're dealing with here. And, again, this one was actually not significant. So, again, the chi-square value is 0.323. So, again, no significant difference um, with that one. So again, right now we're just noticing that really what are the two things that seem to be more likely for a patient to get intubated once they receive ketamine pre-hospital? They show up at nighttime and they're male, right? So then now we have really the only two things that are shown to be kind of factorial in here. And there's another graph I'll show you in a second. Okay. Um, this is interesting because they actually noted that EMS uh, case impression was not included uh, because of inconsistencies in coding, right? So they're trying to eliminate some of that subjectivity there because, again, uh, they already have a lot of that with the providers who are intubating, how they decide who gets intubated, but having EMS, um, those included because they didn't have any kind of standard, um, you know, they weren't following any kind of specific uh, guidelines for that, they, they decided to toss that out. So that's one thing to know. Um, all right, so they did logistic regression. So now we're going to make a model to see if there's any other things that will kind of lead us to more likely think that you know any patient factor is more likely to get intubated. So here's where we get to our adjusted odds ratios. So what's an odds ratio tell us? Yeah, the odds of getting intubated versus not intubated based on some of these demographics. So again, looking at this, we can tell which one of these are going to be uh, statistically significant. And notice how many p-values you see on here. No p-values. But we don't need p-values when we're looking at odds ratios. Similarly, we don't need p-values when we're looking at relative risk. We can just look at the confidence intervals, and that'll tell us all we need to know, right? Are you guys 95% confident that you can do that? Hopefully. Okay, so let's look at this. So first off, we're starting at age. So again, a lot of the patients were, were under the age of 40, so they're looking to see if this had any effect here. Remember, uh, as a reference range, or as a reference, one is going to be your level of significance, right? Because we're doing uh, the odds of one thing happening versus not happening. So because we're doing a ratio, dividing one thing by another, if there's no difference between the two, what would the rate, odds ratio be? One, right? So this means that if the 95% confidence interval includes one, when dealing with odds ratios, it's not significant. If it does not include one, either lower or higher, then you can conclude that it's statistically significant. Okay, so let's look at the results here. So being greater than 40 uh, years of age, right? So 0.76. So just looking at that number, you would think that, hey, they have lower odds if you're older of, of getting intubated. Doesn't you know, necessarily make a whole lot of sense, but when you look at the confidence interval, notice how wide that is. It could go down to 0.29 all the way up to 1.97, right? So it could be almost a two times the odds of, of those patients being intubated just by being over greater than 40, okay? But because it includes one, it's not statistically significant, okay? Looking at the dose that they got, uh, using uh, ketamine dose greater than 5 mg per kilo as your reference, notice here you would expect lower doses, you'd see less intubation, right? Um, due to less hit on the respiratory drive. What do you notice here? Is this statistically significant? Nope, because it includes one. So you can automatically say this is probably just due to chance alone, okay? Uh, looking at gender, again, we can see here that males uh, were 1.91 times the odds of uh, getting intubated. And what do you notice here? Statistically significant, right? It does not include one. It stays above one. But what do you notice about the, the confidence interval? Pretty large, right? So we can go almost down to almost one. It's almost not significant, right? So it's not very close, um, or it's not very far away from being in, insignificant, uh, but it can go up very high as well. So again, there's probably a lot of variability there. And keep in mind, how many patients are we dealing with in these cases? Not a ton, right? So again, if we had a sample size of, say, several thousand, could these results have changed? For sure, right? So again, you can see a much bigger difference uh, if this were the case. Maybe ketamine dose does make a difference, right? If I were to uh, retain the null hypothesis when there actually is a difference, what do you call that? Type 2 error, right? So again, that's usually if you find type 2 errors, 
or if you're uh, going, if you're saying there could be type two errors, it's usually a problem of having too small a sample size, right? So again, uh, then if you have too small a sample size, your power or your study is not powered to show that difference, right? So that's where power comes from, is having enough patience to really show show a difference um, and reject that null hypothesis. Okay, uh, so we, we know gender is going to be important. We also look at the time uh, of arrival to the ED. Uh, so again, looking at the, the evening time, uh, 2.57. So again, almost, you know, two and a half times the odds of, of getting intubated. But notice here, again, is it significant? Yep, but also a huge amount of variability, even more variability than male versus female. Okay, so again, depending if you went to a different hospital, could you find very different results from this? Absolutely, right? So if you went to, say, ORMC downtown and did the same study, you may find very different results uh, because of this. Because they might intubate a different a different training, different um, you know, kind of regional differences. You can find lots of differences there. Okay. And then pre-hospital uh, versed or haloperidol. Again, they're just looking at any. It says how they can put this into a categorical, uh, uh, put it into a nominal uh, category. I can see here, uh, getting no adjunctive sedation is one. Uh, there's a reference and then 1.03. And notice here, also insignificant. Not uh, statistically significant. Does that make sense? Now, if we were looking at relative risks, right, so you're kind of comparing the risk of one versus another, um, what would be your cutoff point for significance there? So if the, the confidence interval includes what number? Zero, right? So remember, with relative risk, zero is your cutoff point. So if the confidence interval includes zero, then it's insignificant, right? For odds ratios, because we're doing a ratio, if it includes one, it's not significant. It's a key point to remember there when you're evaluating uh, tables like these, okay? Or like test questions or things like that. Just saying. Okay, um, so that's kind of the meat of the results here. So just based on this, what could you kind of conclude uh, about this study? What would be your takeaways at this point? Hmm? So... Well, we saw there's a few uh, significant, uh, statistically significant results, right? So if I have someone who gets pre-hospital academy, who's more likely to get intubated? Yeah. Male patients and people who show up at nighttime, right? So I already know that people who show up at nighttime are probably more likely to get intubated anyway, just based on all the situations we mentioned. And we also mentioned there's some, maybe some biases with male patients. So again, clinically, is any of this information super relevant to us? Probably not, right? I'm still probably going to, you know, the provider's still going to evaluate the patients that come in, whether they got ketamine or not, and decide to intubate. The studies like this, even though they're small, you may not be able to, you're not going to change your whole practice based on this. You can take this information and use it to perhaps, um, you know, use it as a uh, justification for doing future studies, larger studies, maybe incorporate several hospitals, uh, things like that. You know, you're starting to see some differences, but maybe if I had a bigger uh, sample size, I could show other differences, right? Or show, show stronger associations. Now, does this mean ketamine causes you to be more more likely to be intubated if you are a male or show up at nighttime? It's not cause and effect, right? There's an association that with this sample size, it, or this sample in particular, it appears that males are more likely to get intubated. If you show up at nighttime, you're more likely to get intubated. And again, if I were to take the whole you know, take the study design, apply it to, say, ORMC, or apply it to somewhere, say, in California, um, you can get totally different results, right? So always keep these things in mind. They're just associations. They're not cause and effect at this point. Okay, um, and again, they're just talking about the different confounders. They talk about a lot of limitations in the study. So again, a lot of these things are uh, things like sample size. A lot of it has to do with um, the reliability of the documentation, having weights available, different things like that. So it's important to make sure they address those limitations uh, so that way you at least know that they thought about it, even if they didn't outright uh, address it in actual statistics. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else. It's kind of interesting. They're talking about who was uh, intubating at nighttime. They had two providers in particular that tend to work a lot of overnight shifts, and they were responsible for a ton of the intubation. So you can see how even individual providers can skew the results of a study because they just had a uh, lower threshold to intubate versus other people, right? So a lot of that goes down to personal preference or their training, their prior experience, things like that. Oh, uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, what, what's a post hoc analysis? What do you think that is? <laughs> Yeah, so this is basically kind of, uh, once the study's done, you have your results, right? So they've done all these analyses. They can then um, start to kind of start to query things. They can kind of start doing these post hoc or after the, the fact analyses where, again, they're not um, drawing any conclusions from these. They're just saying, they're just kind of noticing things. They're saying, like, hey, we noticed these two providers are the ones that were responsible for a ton of intubations overnight. Perhaps that is something that you could use for, you know, you know, a reason to do a future study or something like that. Uh, so post hoc analyses can be really important, but you cannot draw a lot of cause and effect from that. Um, let's see. You know, the key points here. And here they have the limitations. Again, always retrospective single center observational studies cannot suggest causality or apply beyond the center. So again, they, they stated out right there that, hey, 
this may not be super generalizable to all hospitals. Uh, you may not, uh, you know, there's only one center, you know, there's limitations here and that's okay. You know, they, they can, as long as they state that and they're not saying that, yep, absolutely. Guys are get more intubated if they get ketamine. That's not, that's not what they're saying essentially. Um, use your conclusions and then they'll have all the references. So that's basically how you get through a study. Normally it doesn't take two hours or an hour and a half. You get faster with it over time. Um, to go in depth, this in depth, it probably took me like 20 minutes or something yesterday, 20, 30 minutes, um, just to get through it. And again, um, you have to be kind of judicious when you're out there in the clinical world. So obviously, you know, if I was working only in Durham, I probably wouldn't be reading this article. I wouldn't give two flips, right? I'd probably be reading a lot more Durham specific articles and you get better at reading, um, kind of articles in your field as time goes on. So you get kind of better at analyzing those sorts of things. But the, the essentials are the same, right? The bones of the articles are always going to be the same. The statistical analyses are always going to be the same. Um, these principles apply to any type of literature out there. Okay. Does this help at all? Does it make a little bit more sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Again, go take it, look at it different. And you guys have a whole massive library. The world is at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Nova. You guys are paying for it. So might as well use it. <laughs> look up lots of articles. You can find all these kind of things. Um, certainly if you ever have questions, we'll do this a lot uh, in next semester when you have your research methodology course. Uh, and we'll have a part of that's a lit review. So we can talk about that uh, individually later on. But any other questions I can answer for the test? So as far as test questions go, typically what you're going to find is that this will be a little bit wordier than um, a lot of like my farm tests or things like that. Um, it's important not to get freaked out by the amount of detail in the questions, right? Only answer what's on the, the actual questions saying there. So if I ask you, you know, I have these two groups of patients I'm doing a study on and I want to find out this outcome, what type of test would be most appropriate? Like just really kind of focus on the question. Um, even if you're not familiar with the disease state, that's okay. You can look to see that what type of variable are we working with? Um, what type of test should I be using for that? Um, you can evaluate as a paired or unpaired, you know, things like that. Um, and then there'll be some basic definition stuff. Um, but, you know, there's several questions where you're going to have to kind of evaluate things. So like, okay, what would be the best test for this? Or um, what could be my conclusions? You know, is this statistically significant or not? You know, those are, those are good uh, questions to ask. So anything else I can, yes? I will tell you if it's normally distributed or not. Yeah. Or I might ask like, Hey, you know, you're looking at this data. How, what's a way you could, um, I'm trying to think of a, you know, a question like that, but I might ask like, you know, wh what is a way to tell if we have a uh, Gaussian distribution? You say like well, normality test, you know, something like that. Yeah. I would, I would normally put in there. Is it, if it's normally, I would not have you evaluate that based on what I have in the results. Right. Anything else I can answer for you? I'm sure you guys are all thinking farm right now. That's okay. <laughs> All right. Yes. Are there any diagrams on the test? I have one picture in there. I do. <laughs> it's. I, it won't be hard to evaluate. I can tell you that much. This is my first time adding a picture to a test, so you guys are you guys are special. Um, okay. Anything else can I help you guys with? If not. You guys always have my email. Uh, you know, even this morning I was up at 4 a.m. <laughs> with my little monster. <laughs> watching Minions for the 70th time. Uh, and so I could answer you even at 4 o'clock in the morning. So, all right, if not, I will see you guys next time. <laughs>